afternoon. All right, I think we I think everybody's here so we could get started. Um, welcome to the uh, Tuesday, October 18th uh, ARPA Advisory Committee meeting. Um, as always, the uh, public meeting uh, requirements, the meeting of the uh, ARPA Advisory Transformation Committee are public meetings as defined by the Connecticut Freedom of Information Act and should follow these guidelines. As the public meeting is held virtually, it will be recorded and made available to view on the DDS website. Committee members must make a good faith effort to state their name and title if applicable. Each time they speak during the meeting, if a committee member would like to speak, please raise your hand and one of the co-chairs will acknowledge you. There is no public comment portion to this meeting. Members of the public are able to join, watch and listen only. This is Peter Mason, and I believe Tracy is not able to join us today. Is that correct, Keith? Um, I was unsure. She's uh, uh, under the weather, and she was going to try, but she may not. She hasn't been on yet, so uh, it looks like she's not able to join. So you're stuck with Peter and myself today. Um, Next, uh, we have the approval of the minutes uh, from 10-4-2022. Are there any questions regarding the minutes? Motion to approve. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Okay, minutes are approved. Um, moving to updates from committee co-chairs. We'll start with the residential uh, committee update. Peter? Um, yes, hold on. <clears throat> so the residential working committee. Um, so um, as you know, we approved the interim residential incentives. Um, that after that was done, uh, the committee requested more details in terms of the transformational process. Uh, a draft description was presented to them. Um, I've attached a copy for your for the review of this committee, um, and I will go That's over that enough. later this uh, later in the agenda. Um, we discussed items identified by families or individuals that may interfere with moving to an alternative residential setting. Um, we've got uh, a, a collection of uh, items that people have um, identified. Uh, we're looking at, uh, in, we're um, putting together the list uh, that we got from the advisory committee from last time and putting that together. Uh, we'll be sending that on to the day committee for their, um, for their discussion as well. Uh, and the idea is to start to review those once we have the complete list to see what we can do to help minimize some of those issues. Uh, the next um, at our next meeting, we'll be talking about some of the systemic things that may delay or cause delay with moving forward. Um, we have a draft right now and we're looking to add to it. Um, we'll be sharing that. Uh, after that meeting with the day and on the advisory committee to get their input as well. Once again, to collect that list to see what there are, what issues are out there, systemic issues that uh, we can look to see what we need to do to address to help move the process move forward. Um, and then we're also continuing to look at um, some of the alternative residential supports. Uh, we had a presentation on remote supports. We're right now in the process of scheduling with Barry to go over the hub support concept and the ACT program that they use in Demas. And that is the report from the residential committee. Anybody have any questions? 
Okay. Thank you, Peter. Uh, next is myself for the day transformation uh, update. Um, we've had about four meetings so far. The first meeting, again, we went through the committee goals uh, and started our discussion on the incentives. Um, each meeting we've had someone give a presentation and, and uh, we followed um, this advisory committee and had Cheryl give us a presentation on diversity uh, in our second meeting. Uh, we discussed uh, items that would interfere with moving to an alternative day setting and for the day program. Um, again, many of the things we discussed in advisory were talked about, uh, but um, including transportation or lack of public transportation, uh, residential support, residential support for a less conventional schedules, lack of understanding of benefits, uh, number of hours, number of hours for employment compared to day program hours, coordination between residential and day uh, providers, and medical needs and accessibility if they impact work hours or availability of staff. Um, Uh, there was discussions about uh, an ISE program and whether hours included when the individual is involved uh, um, indirect hours basically uh, and whether they would be included with the incentives. Um, then we uh, approved the uh, uh, interim rates. Uh, we did have a presentation in our third meeting by Ali Smalley from NEBA. Uh, they're a program that's fully focused on employment. Um, uh, discussed uh, the Deloitte consultants. Um, and it was actually at the third meeting that we approved the uh, interim incentives. Uh, and then we just had a meeting. Um, and uh, had another presentation on assistive technology and also had a discussion um, from Trevor Rogers uh, uh, from DDS on the uh, Selm Commission and how we could work, uh, how to assist and align with uh, that committee. And that's about it on the day side. Any questions? Michael? Michael Belloff, parent and an agency board member. I, I guess this also goes for, for the, the residential. I wish that there was a, and I know I've said this before and I keep repeating myself, an overriding goal for each of, for the transformation. So when, when I think about day services, I would think that our overriding goal should be to provide, to have individuals we support be active and engaged 30 hours a week. Whether that's in a DSO program, whether that's in some kind of employment, uh, uh, and then extra hours on, you know, using their budget outside of the employment hours because most individuals are probably not going to be employed a full 30 hours a week. Just, you know, what our overarching um, uh, goal is. Obviously, the implementation is using the ARPA dollars for the trans for the transition of individuals from more restrictive environments to less restrictive environments. Um, but I, I I just wish that there was you know kind of our, our overall goals are not the transition itself, but what DDS services should look like. And I think we should kind of keep that in mind. This is Peter Mason. That, that's a that's that's a good idea. We'll, we can bring that back to our committees um, to see what they can do. I do want to say that there was a recently changed um, policy for individuals who are going into ISE uh, that they now can uh, utilize their full annualized lawn amount um, so that if 
uh, it, they won't just get their ISC dollars at this point. They'll then be able to use uh, the additional uh, money that's left over on other day programs, respite or whatever. So that, that was changed. I think that started as of October 1st. So we are moving in that direction to make sure that we don't disincentivize uh, ISA. Barry. So Barry Simon Oak Hill. Um, so I guess continuing on with um, uh, Michael's uh, comment and logic, I you know I really liked the beginning of the transformation description um, where it talks about you know the overall goals of um, uh, you know what the department is striving for. Um, where it fell short for me was that it didn't say something like, you know, and this, you know, this transformation will lead to, um, you know, more opportunity for, for, you know, better choice uh, of services such that, you know, I don't know, more people are getting served with more choice for the same amount of money or, you know, or something like that as far as what we are, um, you know, driving towards and, you know, even taking one step further such that those choices are giving people the right service at the right time for the right costs. Um, Barry, this is Peter. Can we, uh, I'm, I really want that feedback, but I'd rather, I'd like to do it all under the trans, when we get to that and the, the. Okay, yeah, sure, sorry. The agenda yep. item. Um, yeah, I absolutely. Want to jump ahead if we could just follow that, then. But that's that. That's good feedback. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, Kevin, would you like to give a update on the DDF committee? Kevin Bronson, uh, DDS. Uh, I. Is this from our last meeting, an update from our last meeting? Uh, the DDS yes. committee, I don't believe, has met um, from the last meeting, uh, since our last meeting. Um, we're on a three-week schedule. Uh, so, but the just a quick update of the last meeting was, is we, I did, had a, held a presentation of a survey that we conducted of DDS staff finding out um, information about the, uh, issues and uh, internally on uh, on communication wise um, just getting stuff from uh, management down to uh, case management and then out to individuals and families so um, that's about it uh, I think uh, I'm not I I'm not sure what the plan is going uh, for the next meeting because I'm not uh, I I'm not going to be the chair, uh, the co-chair. Um, I'm going to be working with both of the committees as the communications director, and uh, Joe Carvalho, who couldn't attend this meeting today, is uh, the uh, commissioner's executive assistant, is going to take over. Um, but I believe the future direction is to really work with the family and individual, the individuals and family group, because you know it, it's a case manager. I've said this multiple times, but you know the case manager doesn't need to know all. They just need to be resourceful and understand where to find the stuff. So it's kind of it impacts uh, what uh, Shannon and her committee are are or what Shannon and her committee do impacts the work that the uh, DDS engagement committee does. So I guess I'll leave it there. And if people have Barry, is that a question for me? No, that's left over. So, no one has any questions. That's it for me. Keith Lavalette, DDS. Uh, Shannon or Greg, do you have an update on the um, family and individual committee? Uh, yes, we do. This is Greg McMahon from DDS. Um, we've been meeting every uh, two weeks for the last about month and a half. Um, and have been going uh, through the process with our committee of providing um, sort of education uh, around 
um, the different types of services that are included in the incentives and which is essentially covers all the services provided by DDS for the most part. Um, so we've had presentations from various uh, some topic experts on IHS, supportive housing, uh, day services, CCH, um, and um, you know this, the day services covered the whole array of ISC through DSO and everything in between. Um, our next meeting, um, Cheryl uh, will be presenting on diversity, um, and we are going to be beginning our review of the incent residential incenti incentives um and uh in seeking questions concerns and talking about how best to communicate that message um <clears throat> we are eagerly awaiting the finalizing of a agreement with um the communications uh group that is i think just about done being selected uh, so that we can work with them to develop products that will hopefully assist in how we communicate to individuals and families. Um, the uh, to Kevin's point, we are um, having a meeting this week with the chairs of both the <laughs> DDS engagement and the individual and family engagement to figure out how best to combine our efforts um, in a way that's efficient um, and works to come up with a consistent message to all the stakeholders, uh, both staff and individuals and families. We recognize it's important that we be consistent, but it may not always be uh, the same message in the same way to different stakeholders. So we have to evaluate how best to do that and anticipate working with a communications firm to help us kind of navigate that, that area. Um, we are hoping in the end that we will have a, a product of program descriptions that are detailed in various uh, modalities for individuals and families and anyone else to understand the services that are provided and the benefits and challenges of those services. Um, and that's again something we hope to produce with the communications firm. So that's what we've been up to um, and we're continuing to meet every two weeks. Any questions? Or any additions, Shannon? Eve Lavalette, DDS, uh, seeing no questions, uh, we'll continue to move on. Um, the next thing is, uh, Greg had mentioned the communication consultant. I am very happy to announce that um, DDS has hired a, uh, or in, in the process of hiring a communication consultant. Um, we have McDowell Communication Group. Our first meeting will be tomorrow uh, with them. So uh, we'll, we'll be moving forward, forward with that group. So we're happy to get them, them on board. All right, Peter. Uh, the ARPA initiative update. Hi, this is Peter Mason. So uh, at the last meeting, people thought it would be a good idea to uh, provide an update of the whole ARPA initiative versus just the transformational piece. Um, so uh, let me do that. Uh, so the second payments to providers uh, for uh, fiscal stability, uh, employment in, uh, enhancement and infrastructure IT um, enhancements was sent out. Uh, that should have been sent out in earlier this month. Um, providers are doing a quarterly report, so that's due at the end of this month. Uh, we had one uh, one of the Time periods ended on 9.30, so we'll be looking at getting reports back from providers. Um, and believe it or not, there are some providers who um, have not spent anything in those accounts. Um, so uh, because of that, we have to look at taking that money back and then redistributing it. So we'll be trying to figure out how that all plays out. Um, our AT assistive technology expansion, uh, we had issued a notice of opportunity earlier 
Uh, this fiscal year, uh, we have awarded uh, about $600,000 of assisted technology equipment uh, that went um, to providers and to individuals. Uh, we sent out two notice of opportunities, one for individuals and one for providers. Um, those are in the process of being re, um, award. They've been awarded. It's in the process of being uh, money's being in the process of being sent out. Uh, we're looking at probably doing another one, uh, maybe the end of this calendar year or in January um, for once again for providers and individuals. We uh, are waiting to for our, an RFP to go through. Did we lose Peter? Yeah, I think so. No, he's Peter. Peter talk, yeah, you're, I, we you're see back. him, but we don't hear him, I believe. Oh, I don't know what happened. Nope. You're, you're good. You're back. back on. You're back. All right. Um, so we're issuing an RFP for an agency to do uh, AT, assistive technology assessments. Um, right now, the way it is, is that um, when an assessment's needed, then the, then the individual has to look for a, uh, an agency to do this. Uh, so what we're trying to do is kind of, as I've said a number of times, is try to grease the wheel. So we're looking at, uh, through the RFP, to have uh, designated uh, companies, whether they'll be one, two, or three, um, and that they within, if uh, somebody needs an assessment, they could go to those companies. Um, or they could go on their own to find their own person that doesn't have to, but uh, this is just to make sure uh, that we'll have somebody who's doing the assessments. We'll be looking at timelines to make sure that they follow through in a quick manner. Uh, they'll then do the assessments, they'll make their recommendations, and when the recommendation then gets uh, approved, uh, the company then will be uh, uh, in charge of the ordering and the installation of the equipment. So once again, we're trying to do this one shops fits all to get this process going. Uh, we're looking at um, sending out training opportunities for uh, providers and DDS staff for uh, AT training and certification. And another thing we're looking at is uh, establishing an RFP to develop virtual reality training. Um, so if you have an individual that uh, wants to learn how to ride uh, on a public bus, uh, that what we'll be looking at having them start with the virtual reality uh, so that everything will look like they're going on the bus. Lost them again. Lost. Peter, we lost you. Just the audio. Oh. The fun of doing it at central office. There you go, Peter. All right, I'm going to try to go out and come back in. So hold on. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. I hear you now. Uh, let's see what happens. Um, <laughs> I'm not too sure where I left off. Uh, that was the virtual reality training. Did you hear that? Yes. Okay. Um, well, then now I got to find my thing. Um, the uh, the next initiative was enhancing self direction and. We had issued an, uh, an RFP for uh, a company to do a website for helping to recruit um, staff and for families to be able to advertise for that. Uh, that was uh, awarded to Rewarding Work, who did our old uh, website like that, um, but this will be in a much more improved and upgraded 
enhancement. We're been working with DSS for a long time. We'll also incorporate DSS's uh, direct um, hired uh, staff. Um, we're, we're in the process of moving to a new fiscal intermediary. Uh, that's still being negotiated, but if that does, there's some uh, some pieces to that that needs to get resolved in terms of technology. So we'll be working through that. Um, and then there'll be a transition for the staff to go from one FI to another, and we'll be working through that process. Uh, the expanding supportive housing, we're going to be looking at do, providing some provider training or later this year on that. Um, and uh, we're looking at the uh, possibility of doing a, an RFP to establish additional supportive housing sites. Um, but this RFP will be for uh, working with providers that to, to uh, work with existing Now he froze and uh, I'm guessing if, yeah. You're back, but you froze again. Back. I don't know what's going on. I don't know. All right. Um, OK, keep just yelling at me and we'll have to wait. I don't know what's happening. Um, so we're looking at issuing an RFP for additional supportive housing sites um, and these additional sites will be for existing complexes, so not going through the whole process of building a whole new um, apartment complex. So hopefully that will help us move forward with this initiative. Uh, the transformation into the universal assessment. Uh, we're looking at how the universal assessment applies to DDS. Um, and so we've had case managers who have reviewed the uh, the assessment universal assessment with some of their existing individuals uh, that in data has been brought back uh, we're looking at what that then will do in terms of how do we move forward with the universal assessment uh, how that's going to match in terms of the allocation of dollars so there's still some more pieces that we have to go forward with uh, we have contracted with UConn to do the National Core Indicator Surveys, um, who uh, will now be able to do that and then provide analytical data for us. The case management system, uh, we've been working on this with uh, DSS in terms of setting up a what they call an advanced planning document where we would hire consultants to help us determine um, what existing case management systems are out there, uh, whether in another state or whether there's something off the shelf. Uh, we would then look at, uh, once we have identified that, we would then uh, work through the process of um, setting up a planning document, which is a different one with CMS. Um, and then we would look at in, um, beginning to uh, implement that into the department. And lastly, our critical incident, we are setting up an advanced planning document with DSS on that. Um, and this is to add additional pieces to Pulse Light. Pulse Light is a program that looks at Medicaid data and looks at incident reports. And so, for example, if an individual is uh, admitted into the hospital, there'll be a Medicaid claim. And if we look at that, we'll look at that claim and then say, was there an incident report? And now, for example, uh, if it's one of those that's not a critical incident, it's not going to be a big deal. But we, when we did our first data, there were some pieces where we saw the first time we did this was about two years ago we saw individuals who had head injuries and uh, we never we didn't have any critical incidents to that so this is going to help us in terms of our quality assurance piece to make sure that we're keeping up to uh, what's happening out in the field and if uh, an individual gets placed into the put into the hospital we'll start trying to figure out what happened and what 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 do we miss and then what how do we correct that 
that is where we are with the ARPA initiative. Does anybody have any questions? I'll start with um, Shannon. Peter. I'll start with Shannon. Hold on. I'll start oh. with Shannon. Uh, hi, uh, Shannon Jacobino, DDS Ombuds person. Um, I have two questions. You had mentioned something about doing a training on supportive housing, and I was wondering who would that training be for? Who would that directed it? It would, it would be directed. That would be be directed at providers. Um, we probably need something for individuals as well and would have to I'd have to I'll go I can go back to the committee if that's what your question is as to how do we start giving more. I know we did one. They did do one on there every fourth um, mm -hmm. of the month. They do a training and stuff, so I know that was out there. This would be more for the nuts and bolts for the providers as to how to do it. Sure. Yeah. No, I mean, I, it wasn't a uh, question. I wasn't, this is Shannon Jacobino, DDS Ombuds person. I wasn't going anywhere with that. I just wanted to know. And um, <laughs> um, the other question I had, well, I guess I'll also make a comment about supported housing. You know, one of the issues that seems to come up when you talk to families is the lack of um, options uh, in the Fairfield County area. And, uh, you know, I know that Part of the issue is being able to find a developer that wants to be a part of a project. But I think maybe looking into some ways to do some outreach in that area or to see if there's any way to be more proactive in trying to find developers in areas of the state where there is a need, I think would be helpful. Um, and then the other question I had was around the case management system and you know what specifically you're looking at? I mean, what is it that you are trying to do? Is it the role of the case manager? Is it the reporting systems? I'm just not clear on what you're looking at. Okay, this is Peter Mason. So uh, back to the um, issue of places that don't have supportive housing now, that is going to be one of the criteria for the um, RFP, if that's what they're going to be doing, that will be to look at sites that we haven't ha that we don't have them right now. So that's going to be part of that. Uh, so the case management system will be right now we have what's called e cameras or cameras. Um, it's a system that's probably about 20 years old and it's not very user friendly. It's not very um, flexible. So we're looking at that whole piece and to be to with that, we're looking at uh, having that be part of uh, the case. Uh, the individual plans would be part of that. So that it would be as you're putting in that, it's going right into the system. And we're looking at hooking that also up with authorization. So if on the IP they say Johnny is going to go to a GSE for 30 hours, that then will transfer to the authorization system to build that authorization. Um, so that will be available. Uh, we're looking at it to be um, more um, transparent so that individuals and families would be able to go on to the system, be able to see what's in there. Uh, we'll be looking at the same thing for providers. So providers would be able to go on to the system and pull off the, the, the IPs and pull off the authorizations. So we're trying to get move ourselves into a more electronic world and um, so uh, we do know that there are a number of states that have a combination of uh, case management authorization system. Uh, so they'll be looked at to see if we we don't want to reinvent the wheel, if we can use their system. Um, that's what we're going to try to do. Uh, we know we have a short time period to do this in. So um, once we get through this planning, document piece we will be hiring consultants to go out and find an existing system that we then can use instead of build something that may take a very long time. Great, thank um, you. Let's see, uh, I heard it was Steve, were you, was, were you yes. asking? Go ahead. Yes, just really quickly because it's not that relevant but you, for what we're doing, but you mentioned something about virtual reality training. And I never thought about this, but that could be really revolutionary for you know members of the um, of the community that the DDS serves in terms of safety, 
issues and um, tasks of daily living and things like that. So I know it's in its infancy, but um, I'm wondering if the DDS could look for grants from some of the leading companies like Facebook and others who are kind of leading the charge in the virtual reality field to maybe get some grants to see how that technology could be used for specifically for the disability community. This is Peter Mason. Yeah, we're, right now we'll be using the opera dollars in our assisted technology account uh, to to uh, look into that. Uh, we know Tennessee had done um, a virtual reality training RFP and we're trying to see if we can model that and uh, there's some really unique things that they. Thank you. Uh, Barry. Yeah, um, Barry Simon O'Kill. Um, so I guess playing off of Shannon's comment, um, even one step further, I would hope that whatever system you're looking at also interfaces um, with all electronic health records, um, you know, real health records, not, you know, Therap um, kind of systems. And um, I guess my next question is, um, when you were talking about that you're reviewing the um, universal assessment rather than or possibly replacing the lawn, I'm hoping that that's just for services, not for payment. And we're moving away from the, the, the existing payment system more towards a people get paid for the services, not just this arbitrary amount um, kind of system. And so I, I, I don't know if um, that's part of that. And then um, I guess lastly, the um, other thing that I wanted to ask about in, in line with this is as you're um, looking for supportive housing um, and going into existing um, housing, I don't know if this becomes an opportunity to look at some of the um, vacated uh, residential sites to be looking for developing alternative types of supported or supervised uh, models that could be used uh, as a component of developing the continuum of housing options. Uh, this is Peter Mason. I know you're not a big fan of the lawn allocations, um, and uh, but I do know that at this point, that's what we're still moving towards um, and uh, to make sure that individuals who have um, like or similar uh, levels of need get the same amount of dollars. Um, so that, I mean, that still is part of that uh, equation. I'm sure when they're looking at that, they'll be looking at a whole variety of things. So that could be part of it. Um, and part of the, the second piece, I'm not too sure what the last part about the supportive housing and existing structures, I'm not too sure what you were talking about with that. You, you had mentioned that you were going to be looking at, at creating supportive housing that is going into existing um, apartment structures rather than um, developing new ones. And so I just wanted to throw out there that there are supportive housing um, options that could be utilizing either vacated, um, you know, group homes or other um, traditional uh, existing housing things like three family homes that could be easily converted in ways that could create supported housing options. So I just want to make sure that that was kind of in the mix of consideration as you're looking I think, to. I, mean, I think the, they're looking at that as within the if it's within the guidelines of the supportive housing model. Um, I mean, if you uh, if if you have alternatives, I don't know if that's the place where that's going to be part of. Um, I would assume that if you're doing a transformational plan, 
you know, what you could put that into the transformational plan as some of those options, and then it would then become uh, highlighted for uh, DDS to look into. So, okay. Thank you. Keith Lavalette, DDS, and any other questions? All right, seeing none. We're going to move on to the discussion from committee members on <clears throat> items identified by families or individuals that may interfere with moving to an alternative day or residential setting. While money is a main factor, what other issues would get in the way? And yeah, this and is we, the feedback on the residential committee. Yeah, so this is Peter Mason. We we had sent this out to everybody, so I don't know if anybody had a chance to look at that. Um, and any comments you have? Um, and we're, as I said, we're trying to compile a list and figure out how to attack that list. So um, uh, we'll be adding the pieces to that we have that we identified la at our last committee. I'll be adding that onto the list. Uh, we can send that out so you have the full list at that point. Uh, and we'll be sending this to the day uh, and getting days um, pieces to that as well. Um, but if people have any other issues, observations, comments, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, that's what we're looking at trying to do. Keith Lavalette, DDS, uh, Shannon, do you have a question? So I know that we discussed this last week, so we don't need to rehash what we already discussed, but I, I think that um, it would be helpful for you to, you know, to give whatever you have to the individual and family engagement committee, because I think in terms of communicating with families, we're going to come up with some of our own and we'll share those with this committee, but also getting feedback from others would be helpful in terms of, you know, kind of thinking about how we're going to be communicating with people. This is Peter Mason. That's a great point. We, I will send that on to that committee. Keith Lavalette, DDS. Um, any other questions? Comments? Barry. So, um, Shannon, um, in your committee, uh, Barry Simon O'Kill. Um, in your committee and looking at the um, the concerns of the family are um, if that if this list goes over to the family, I don't know whether um, I know the provider perspective is not necessarily um, what the family committee is about, but is it helpful to have an informative the same way I, I guess I'm coming in to talk to the residential committee. But just to understand what options are out there that could be um, breaking down some of the concerns um, kind of thing. And so didn't know if that would be helpful. Shannon Giacobino, DDS Ombuds person. I mean, I think absolutely. I know that last time we had this discussion here, I think providers offer a different perspective based on their communications with families about what some of the reluctance might be or what some of the pushback might be. And so I think all of that information is helpful in figuring out the best way to communicate with families, you know, sort of taking it all in and figuring out the best way to um, to address those things as they come up. There has been a focus in our committee as we've done presentations on uh, the different support options offered through DDS and not just focusing on what works, but also what challenges um, people have faced and what providers who have come to us, um, you know, having them, you know, talk to us about are there people who you feel aren't a good match for this model or you haven't had success um, so that families can make informed decisions um, with all of the information, not just the good stuff. Um, yeah, and this is Greg McMahon, DDS is also chair of that committee. Um, we The pr uh, presentations we've been doing have been made by providers okay. um, who are doing the services, um, uh, with the exception, I think, of the day service, which was wrapped up in our employment 
staff for DDS who gave an overview of all the services. Um, but every other presentation has been done by a uh, agency provider. And have those presentations also included what could be, not just what is. I say yes, they have. Uh, you know, people are asking a lot of questions about how things work um, and uh, are offering input on, I think, what could be and also raising concerns and fears, which Shannon and I will be trying to compile as part of this overall discussion. Thank you. Keith Lavalette, DDS. Uh, Kathleen? Thank you. Uh, when I was on the rack, I was always amazed at the extent to which the meeting would often um, involve parents asking question after question after question about how providers operate, how best to interact with uh, providers, what's the best way to have these conversations about the concerns and things. And fear so often is rooted in a lack of information. And I often felt, first of all, I was glad to answer any question. It was a very, you know, I think positive exchange, but I felt really bad that parents didn't know where to go um, to get that information. I'm happy to, to have a conversation at any point, but I would think it would be rather daunting if you're a parent and you have all these questions or you really don't understand exactly how the system works and how providers fit in um, and how we work with DDS, and I, I'm not sure what the remedy for that is. I certainly would be willing to be a person who would be willing to be available to parents who might have questions. I'm pretty sure there are a lot of other providers who would be willing to do the same thing. But I do think parents should have a place to go within the provider network to get questions answered for what I found to be quite legitimate questions that as a parent I would want to have answered as well. Uh, this is Greg McMahon, DDS. I know I'm not next in the queue, but because we're working with that, the, the committee that is trying to address some of the concerns of families or figure out how best to communicate with families, I, th uh, I think our plans through the process are to work with uh, and hopefully getting some help from the communication vendor on how to best set up communication forums for families. Um, and all families, uh, not just those that typically come to the meetings to hear about stuff, but the families that are harder to reach. Um, and there's probably more people we have a hard time reaching than there are people who are actively engaged. So we're working to try and figure out how best to do that. Um, and we're hoping um, people who are better at it than us um, will help us do that. Keith Lavalette, DDS. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Stephen. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to comment on item seven on the document you sent out, Keith, about um, items that are identified that may interfere with moving to an alternative residential setting. It was a two page document. Um, so item seven was, are there other incentives that can be developed to encourage more, more alternative residential sites? By the way, Stephen Siegel, our parent, um, I've um, been involved in a couple of successful um, matters with private real estate developers who normally are very loath to build things on spec, but in exchange for um, an assurance of occupancy, for example, uh, putting together apartments where they're assured that they'll, it, they'll be filled with, uh, with tenants, um, they would go ahead and, and use their own capital to um, construct housing alternatives that are specifically geared to um, the community we're serving. So um, I just think that's a possibility of partnerships with private developers where the assurance of um, tenants uh, can you know, provide them the incentive to um, provide housing alternatives. This is Peter Mason, DDS. Steve, that's what we've been doing with the supportive housing, uh, that those apartments have been um, designated for individuals with ID for 15 years. Mm -hmm. And so we have, um, you know, so those that have gone through the, that process, especially with the Department of Housing and stuff, we've 
we've uh, made that commitment for that time period. Um, it's it's it serves a couple per, per things. One for the developer, but also for our individuals. Also knowing that they'll have stability in that, um, and those also are low income, so those usually are better in terms of rent and stuff uh, right. for individuals. Okay, I wasn't familiar with that. Thank you. Okay, Keith Lavalette, DDS, any other questions? Okay, the transformation description draft document, Peter. Yes. This, uh, let's see. I'm going to try to bring that up, so hold on. Let me know if people can see that. Yes, we can. So we sent this out. Um, I want to start off that this is a draft. Um, it's a working draft. Um, I needed to get something together uh, that started to try to explain what we're trying to do. Um, and so we were starting to share this. We shared this with the residential committee first um just because they were the ones who actually asked for some more information and this was the right vehicle and i thought um so i'm going to go through this we sent it to everybody um it's lengthy um but um i think it kind of gives it lays out what the thinking is right now and um so as people have any issues concerns or thoughts uh Anything that you, any kind of feedback is appreciated because I'm trying to, uh, we're, we're trying to work through this to make sure that this document uh, works for now. Uh, we know that as we get into the second phase, we will probably have to readjust and re amend this, um, but this kind of is a good uh, starting place of where we're at. Um, so we start off with, um, why we're doing this, where we're doing this, and the goal. And I think um, Barry's point about, you know, what we're expecting uh, at the end um, is a, is good feedback. So I can start uh, having our committees look at that so that I can get more information from that. So we may have something generic to start off with, um, and then we can start keeping adding to this document. Um, this is you know, this is for transformation and it's for uh, congregate settings. So we're looking at uh, community living arrangements, continuous residential supports. Um, we're looking at in day program, day support option and uh, segregated group supported employment work sites. Um, then it talks about Deloitte and I'll get into Deloitte in a little bit. Uh, and we're using incentives. Oh, I'm going to go through this quick. I'm not reading the whole thing. Um, so we've decided that we're going to do phase two different phases. The first one, first phase being voluntary. Uh, the second phase uh, will then uh, be for all providers with a congregate day or a residential setting will have to develop a plan. Uh, this will be uh, so that everybody starts to um, starts to put their minds in there. Uh, actions as to how do we want to move forward as we uh, start making this transformation. It talks about the phase one process um, and we're, we're working with Deloitte. So Deloitte will be available for uh, technical assistance for those providers that want to start this voluntarily. Um, and we're working through the process as to how that would come out in terms of uh, what that would look like and how do we, how do they get, how does that get uh, requested? Um, let me see the phase two piece we've talked about uh, in terms of this will be uh, for uh, Deloitte after Deloitte uh, recommends uh, their tr the transformational process based on their research. Um, and 
so that we'll be working through that piece. Um, it talks about the transition plans, what the transition plans are for. Uh, basically, the com components will be to describe the current service, what the new service that you're looking at doing, uh, the budget for that, are there any deficits right now in resources that need to help you go through that process? And then how is that going to be sustainable? Um, the pr approval process will go through the region and we're working through the regions to make sure that we have the right people identified uh, so that they'll be able to work through those plans. Um, it talks about what the alternative community-based supports are and list those. Then it goes into the incentives and um, we talked about all the different incentives, the residential and day piece. Um, we're looking at um, their one time requests that uh, may be needed if there is uh, additional clinical or maybe a job developer role that needs to be included. How does that get reimbursed? And so we're looking at how do we do that through a one time request? Uh, we've worked through with DSS in terms of the room and board supplement. Uh, we started the process of having uh, the room and board go through DSS, the supplemental piece, but that was going to become too time consuming and very complicated. Um, so we've worked in agreement with DSS that if you have a group home and you're going to go from four down to one and then restructure that home or close it, uh, DDS will pick up the um, room and board rate uh, to make sure that we offset any uh, any loss of revenue uh, while that transition is being made. Um, we're looking at safeguards in terms of transition. And, you know, this is a piece that um, we would like, I, we really want your feedback on this um, and trying to, how do we balance that between the needs of the individual and the needs of the provider? Um, and so we're looking at safeguards that would uh, basically allow an individual who decides to go to, uh, want, uh, through the transformation process, if within any time during the first 60 days. Um, and once again, these are all drafts. Um, if the first 60 days and they don't like it and they want to go back, there'll be no questions asked and they'll be able to go back to their current setting. Uh, after 60 days, at that point, um, they'll still be allowed to return but depending on the availability of vacancy of the provider, because at that point they may be moving in a direction where they're trying to restructure the house or close it, uh, that that opportunity may not be there at that house, um, but they'll have the, they'll still um, to, to go into a program uh, similar to where they left. Uh, and then after 120 days and up to a year, uh, they'll still have the uh, chance to get up to their annualized authorized amount that they had. But at this point, it may be, you know, uh, there may be more discussions with the region and the, uh, the provider as to, you know, what's the best supports for them and um, how does this work? Um, and um, and then after a year from then, uh, they'll they would go back. They would be just into the regular Pratt process. Um, so that's as I said, that's a rough draft that we're starting through. And then it talks about financial reporting. So as I said, I wasn't going to read this whole thing. I just wanted to get people's um, idea of what it was, uh, what we're looking at, um, and looking for people's feedback. Um, and uh, as we move forward, as I said, we have gave it to the residential committee. The day committee will be taking a look at it. Um, the engagement committees will be taking a look at it. Uh, we've got the regionals, the regional uh, offices are looking at it. And so uh, we're trying to make sure that whatever we come up with, that it's all um, 
that that everybody has seen it and may may not agree to it, but they understand why we're going that way. Whew. Um, I see Michael. Michael Belloff, parent. Um, I think it is a great, a great first start. As a parent, seeing this, um, the the phase one is the phase two scares the crap out of me. Phase two looks like after agencies volunteer to set up a plan. We're going to force them to have a plan to close group to close group residences. I think we need to be gentler in the language of phase two. That um, this is for individuals where it is appropriate for them to be in a less restrictive environment. It looks yeah, like in phase two agencies are going to be forced to close group close CLAs and CRSs and move folks out. And I do not believe that is what you're implying. No, no. Our the intent here was that everyone should be looking at a plan and what that transformational plan would be for that agency. Um, and um, I think you know we're we are looking at transformational stuff. So I think to have uh, half the providers sit on the sidelines, I don't think that that will help us. And I know that there'll be some controversy in terms of what that will be and i think that needs to get explained as we go into the second phase so how i right. word i'll try to rephrase this uh, I, but that's I, yeah I, I would pray that that each agency should be will be in phase two each agency will have to have a plan to move individuals where is appropriate for them to be in a less restrictive environment that will ensure that families will know that individuals who need that 24-hour support will be able to remain where they are I think it would be wonderful, especially if this is going to be an electronic, uh, if this is going to go out through email, where you've listed the different styles of alternative uh, residential opportunities, such as iDash or, um, you know, all the, I, I, you went through too fast for me to look at all, you list about four or five or six different alternatives being developed. If there was linked to a description of what that means, that parents, because this is also going to be driven by parents, it's not, this is not just shouldn't be agencies pushing people out, but parents involved in, in helping decide what's the most appropriate environment for the child and being able to, uh, or adult, excuse me, and being able to see a, a plain language description of what that option entails. Which which is hard to find these days. Most I think on the current website there's only like a small one paragraph on each option. Um, so parents understand why you know why I dash or why this or why that or shared housing or what that looks like. So they understand what that looks like and why that might be appropriate for their child. And they may then want to have their child to be in a less restrictive environment based on those individuals' needs. This is Peter Mason. Thank you, Michael. You you have a copy of that, so just so you know, that was sent to you, so you should have a copy. Um, and um, one of the things that this is probably more slanted for the providers. So one of the things that this, when we uh, the the individual and family group will be looking at, how does this translate to individ individuals and families, and how does that work? And I think the link that you're talking about as it would be, uh, that's a great idea. So we'll have to look at how we can we can encompass that. We've also sent this to Deloitte, so maybe I can have them do some of that stuff so that we have that link, so that's great. Um, and I think one of the other things that we are um, working through is the process of, if we're gonna make this mandatory, we have to make sure that it's not an unfunded mandate. Uh, and so we'll be looking at um, a re at some kind of compensation for our providers that do the plan. And um, so we're trying to figure out what the best mechanism mechanism that would be as well. So uh, Peter Mason, uh, Barry. So um, Peter, it's funny you said that this was slanted to the uh, Barry Simon Oakill. 
uh, to the provider. When I read it, I was like, oh, this is a really good descriptor for parents and families, but it really doesn't meet the needs of the providers. Yeah, that's um, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to me, I, that's what that's the feedback I was going to give that as a provider, this does very little for me to know what I'm transforming to. Um, I, like I get what you want me to do, but I, 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 I would be irresponsible if I responded because I don't know what it is that you want me to transform to. And when it comes to me being able to be um, a provider, I, you know, if there's no money, there's no mission. And so I need to know, you know, the, the incentives are, are okay and, and, and it's nice to help get through, but I don't know what I'm building to and I don't know how I'm going to sustain um, these services if I don't know what the rates are. So and for I think me, you guys are having a meeting with the department uh, regarding that issue, Barry, on Monday. Yeah. Yep. So for me, um, I just recommend that this either hold or just acknowledge that you know that's going to be looked at in a way that um, and what is the the goal of that process. And I can say that. Um, you know, I was just down at the Anchor conference um, where uh, and and the Easter Seals conference and at both conferences, you know, I can cite, you know, Delaware, Arkansas, Missouri, where this same process is in play. Um, but it is all about um, identifying the rate methodology in order to come up with sustainable rates and identifying what the goals are of the services and those rates to sustain a system that is going to give people choice. So I just recommend that something be in there that's going to meet the needs of providers to get buy-in, because otherwise you're just going to leave them hanging. Keith Lavalette, BDS, uh, win. Hi, Win Everts, the Ark of Connecticut and a parent. I guess um, along the same lines as what just the last few speakers have said, is it fair for families to think about how they would like their individuals supported and suggest support structures to the individual and family committee or the residential committee? Because there are a lot of different ways to support people with IDD that are practiced to, across the United States and not all of them are in Connecticut now. Um, do you foresee the flexibility to adopt new structures that are not used for the IDD population in Connecticut as a result of this transformation? Or are you going to continue to use the same service structures. This is Peter Mason. Uh, well, first off, what we're looking at doing in this uh, with Deloitte, well, Deloitte will be doing um, the, um, what's the what term I'm looking for? Um, they'll be surveying and talking to families to get what they want to see. So, I mean, that, I think that's where that's going to come about. Um, I think what we're looking at is, and I've said this over and over, you know, we have a certain time period that we have this, this, this. so um, we're not opposed to new supports. The issue is going to be if those supports uh, need to be updated into our waiver. There's a waiver process that takes, you know, probably six, more than six months, probably nine months to a year. Yep. Um, and you know, if we wait to see when that happens, then this isn't going to happen. So I think we we know we that you know we know what we need to do now, and we know what we have now. But those other supports, as we need to go build towards that, um, my hope is is that you know those will be identified to Deloitte, and at that point we then come up with a plan as how do we then um, um, systematize or uh, implement those programs and how you know what's the process to do that thank you 
Keith Lavalette, TDS, any other questions or comments? So this is Peter Mason. What I would ask everybody is to please read through this. Um, you know, we have two phases to this. So this, you know, this first one um, is probably going to be more geared to the first phase, but a lot of that, some of the lingo is going to uh, apply to the second phase, but maybe not all the pieces to it. So, um, you know, not to have this out there is going to confuse everything with the first phase. So I think we need to have something. Um, and um, so please go through it. Give me your comments, your suggestions, your feedbacks, um, and so that I can try to address those uh, into the final version. Keith Lavalette, DDS. All right, the uh, next agenda item is the Deloitte update. Hey, this is mine too. How am I? I keep talking on this thing. I don't know why. Um, all right, so Deloitte. Um, we've been meeting with Deloitte, um, and uh, one of the things that uh, is on our agenda is how do we, um, how do we work with Deloitte and the advisory committee? And so we're discussing on how that's going to work out. And, um, I know that I don't know. I think that's in our next agenda as to how we are working through that. You know, what's the what's the process? And then we'll come back to you, see what you guys think, and then see if then we can move forward. Um, so right now, what they're doing is a lot of gathering stuff. So they're gathering data on the Connecticut landscape um, and the details in terms of just DDS stuff. Uh, they're in the process of an initial review and they're going to provide DDS with a slate of states to take a look at, and then we will then choose from that list. Uh, they'll be looking at uh, states that identify promising practices for service approaches and transformation strategies. They're looking at residential services, day services, uh, considering overall quality and characteristics um, including AT, assistive technology. They're going to be looking at rate methodologies. Um, they looked at, uh, they're going to utilize the uh, Supported Employment Leadership Network resources, and um, they're continuing to um, find uh, employment statistics from various sources from other states to see how they've been successful, to see what we can do. Uh, we've been discussing the initial provider wave, and uh, there we've talked about the technical assistance, uh, which would be one-to-one -one assistance. Uh, it may include drafting plans or revising plans, depending on the need of the provider. Um, they'll be looking at whether they want representatives from the state at those technical assistance meetings. Um, and this will also apply going into the second phase. You know, do they want it? Does the provider want it confidential to start, or do they want to be upfront from the beginning? Um, I think we're going to try to give that as a choice to the provider. Um, they're trying to figure out um, what the template will look like, and uh, we just got to. I just saw a draft come through now, so I haven't even looked at it. So we'll be talking about that. Um, and they'll be looking at um, the overall structure of it. The, um, this is the initial template. This isn't going to be the final one. This is for the initial phase. Um, they'll, whether there's optional sections for whether people are um, restructuring a group home and how that would look, how that would work. Um, it's going to require providers to explain how their plans apply to congregate settings and how they're individualized, team driven and person centered. Um, they should be able to work for providers determining only that, that so they'll if providers want to do this in two stages. So the first phase, they want to just do one program. They should be able to do that in the first phase. And if they want to do uh, additional uh, programs in the second phase, they would be able to do that. Um, and 
it's going to focus at this point on the initial wave on the readily available transformation options we have now um, because that's what we have in place. And that's what we've been doing with Deloitte. So Peter Mason, Barry. So um, you said a few things that um, I had questions about. So the first thing um, was that they're going to be looking at rate methodologies. And again, having just talked to a bunch of people who are going through this, I know one of the things that they um, are doing as they're reviewing their rate methodology is trying to figure out um, what are the actual costs of the regulations that apply to the various levels of care? And so um, I don't know whether Deloitte is looking at that, but um, certainly that's a component of it. And then it allows you to put in if your goal is to have, you know, the cost of um, nursing, the cost of LPN, the cost of uh, DSP, the cost of whatever you're driving to as your goal. So, for instance, if we are driving to a $20 an hour um, DSP rate, or if we are driving towards a, you know, $40 an hour nursing rate, you can change up what the costs are to the, you know, levels of care. And then that gives you, you know, approximately what your rate should be. So then you're able to see the gap between what your costs are for just your regulation on what your levels of care are and what your actual payments are. And then that gives you, you know, your difference. The other question I had is knowing that Deloitte has a bunch of, you know, accountants and actuaries as part of their fleet is part of the assessment going to be, this is how many um, residential CLA beds we need because this is how many people we have on our planning list. This is how many of these, you know, level, you know, whatever the, the level of service is going to be, what is the projected need if we want to reduce the, um, the planning list or the wait list or the, you know, call it whatever you want. And if you suddenly come up with holy camoli, we actually need, you know, I don't know, this much more. And so it's it's going to require, you know, this many more jobs to do it. Part of this, you know, play becomes we have the ability to create 5,000 jobs here in Connecticut if these services are properly funded. And, you know, the way the governor reacts is, you know, if any company were to show up and say, we're, you know, we need 5,000 jobs, um, he'd be, you know, rolling out the Yukon marching band and, you know, to, to have them playing at whatever. So it becomes a, a different way to make sure that the system is appropriately looked at. So I don't know whether Deloitte is looking at all these things as part of this system transformation or, or if this is if that's not part of what they're looking at. Well, and, and this is Peter Mason. And, and as I said, the, the complicating thing here is that DSS is going to be a, doing a rate study on DDS. And we're waiting for them to come back to us as to when that's going to happen. Um, so how much Deloitte can do here is pretty minimal at this point until we can get some specifics out of what they're doing with DSS. In terms of other states, they can look at that um, in terms of those kind of methodologies of how the other these states have done that in terms of the transformation. In terms of the um, projected need, we haven't had that conversation, but that's a good conversation to have, and I can bring that back to them. Great. Okay, thank you. The only thing I would say, this is Peter Mason, be careful what you ask for, uh, because as with anything, you know, whatever the variables are, 
It could look like you need more group homes. It could look like you need a whole lot less. And once something gets out there public, um, then you never know what can happen with that data. Peter Mason, Kathleen. Kathleen Stell for the Ark Eastern Connecticut. I th I think that's why wise advice, Peter. I would just say that um, in terms of what Barry's saying, I think if we could quantify the uh, impact on the uh, economy by paying a fair price for employment vis-a-vis -vis what we did with some real success some years ago, basically, you know, back when we were a $10 million organization talking about how we, you know, put put a hundred, a uh, million dollars back into the economy here. We paid this much taxes. Um, that was huge and it really shifted the conversation in, in Southeastern Connecticut, you know, hardware store owners and the Rotary who were sitting around saying Norwich has too many nonprofits changed their minds really fast. And it led to a really constructive, productive public private partnership with um, businesses and jobs and, um, you know, uh, restaurants. And so I would like to see Deloitte use their bandwidth to show the advantages of in investing properly in human services, which I think Barry's point, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, is no different than Boeing. Yes, we're we're not rocket scientists, but um, certainly there can be a quantification of the state's return on investment. And I don't think that has anything to do with whether we shut down group homes or not. I think it's got to do with whether we're giving families what and, and people with IDD what they need. And, and it speaks to the ability we have to do that at a very high level of accomplishment. I wish I had those words coming out of my mouth. So thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Keith Lavalette, DDS, any other questions or comments? All right. Um, I just want to add um, well, our next meeting. Peter Mason, Keith, I see Michael's hand is up. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed it. Go ahead. Michael. No, and and, and it, just one final comment on on the last couple of statements. You know, in terms of 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 uh, uh, bang for our buck, they should be reminded that half of DDS's budget is paid for by Medicaid, and so that raising our funds, you know, Connecticut only pays fifty cents on the dollar. And we're getting all of these other benefits by doing so. And I think most people don't realize that. And I think most legislators forget it because the, the Medicaid reimbursement goes back into the general fund, not back to DDS. And I think that if we're pushing those pieces, that should be stressed. This is Peter Michael Mason. Bello, these, these are all good ideas, but um, Deloitte is not here to advocate or uh, additional funding. So they can do some analysis, but if there's a bigger piece that needs to be done, a bigger piece to that, it's not gonna be done through the ARPA initiative. It would have to be done through um, the DDS leadership and the Alliance. Uh, so I just wanna make sure people don't get their hopes up that oh, Deloitte's gonna do all this stuff. Some of this stuff, they could come up with data, um, but, you know, I just have to make sure we're a little cognizant of the limits that we can do with this. Keith Lavalette, DDS. Um, all right, with no more questions. Uh, our next meeting is scheduled for November 1st, but I just want to put out to the committee, since there was issues with the invite, I'd like to send resend that invite. Um, but I'd also, instead of just sending one invite for that one date, that's the last scheduled one we have. Um, is everybody still good 
with this time period going forward, I could do an invite through, I'm thinking like the end of January. Is everybody okay with doing that? Sure. All right, so I'll send a new invite because I'm not sure what happened uh, with people getting on. So uh, everybody will get a new invite for the November 1st meeting. And th with that, um, we have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All right, thank you everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. I know. Thank you.